Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the concept of free radical injury. This is a very high yield topic because we're going to be discussing many different disease pathologies as well as physiologic concepts in this topic. So make sure you take your time with this content. As always, don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support means a lot to us and it allows us to keep this content free. So with that being said, let's dive right in by first discussing what free radicals are. Free radicals are basically uncharged molecules that have an unpaired valence electron. Now these are chemical species with an unpaired electron that are typically very highly reactive yet short-lived. So even though they are present for a very short amount of time, they can cause a lot of havoc, especially in certain conditions where there are a lot of free radicals released at the same time. Now for our purposes, they're going to mainly pertain to oxygen because oxygen is one of the most important free radical uh, components in terms of our body that you need to know about. So remember, these are really going to have to to do with oxygen in the human body. Now, free radicals are generated both pathologically but also physiologically. That means it is also a normal part of our body to generate free radicals. One example of physiologic uh, free radical formation would uh, be the oxidative phosphorylation cascade. Free radicals are formed during oxidative phosphorylation because cytochrome C oxidase actually transfers electrons to oxygen. It is the final or the terminal electron uh, acceptor in the oxidative phosphorylation cascade. Now, along the way, as oxygen is accepting the proper amount of electrons, you are going to get partial reduction until it gets to a certain point where it is completely reduced. At all points, it is going to generate free radicals, especially if that whole process of oxidative phosphorylation is uh, interrupted. That will lead to partial reduction, and therefore you will get free radicals in that uh, process. You can also see physiologic response uh, in the body. I guess you can call it pathologic, but also physiologic when you're trying to fight off an infection, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So free radicals have to do with oxygen. And the way they function is that at every step, you are going to get a new electron. So the first electron that an oxygen molecule actually accepts will create something called superoxide. And these names are important because they're going to come back, so commit them to memory. If you give a superoxide one electron, you are going to produce hydrogen peroxide because you will also bind to a hydrogen molecule or peroxide if the hydrogen is not there. And then finally, if you get one more electron from there, you will get to a hydroxyl group. And this group is very important. We're going to talk about this in a second. The hydroxyl group. And then when you give a hydroxyl group another electron, you will form water. All right. So this is the simple cascade you need to remember for free radicals because we're going to come back to it I'm almost at the end of this lecture. So keep that in the back of your mind. So let's now talk about free radicals as, as uh, the development pertains to pathologic generation. So when it comes to pathologic generation of free radicals, one of the most common ways our body can generate free radicals is through ionizing radiation, aka cancer therapy. In this, the hydroxyl uh, free radical is, is what is usually produced. All right, but you can also see free radicals being formed in inflammation. Inflammation in this situation, the white blood cells are going to go through something called an oxidative burst via NADPH oxidase. They do this because those free radicals that white blood cells can kill can actually destroy whatever uh, abnormal pathologic process is going on in the body, whether it's an infection or a uh, mishap of cells that aren't functioning properly. Now, other things that can lead to free radical formation are metals, especially iron. Iron content and to having too much iron can damage the body and the way it damages the body is through free radical formation. Chemicals like uh, carbon, uh, um, carbon tetrachloride, which is a very, very high yield topic we're going to be discussing in this lecture, can also lead to free radical formation. Metabolism of drugs, especially in phase one, as well as redox reactions can also cause free radical formation. Now, when it comes to free radicals, we talked about three types. We got the superoxide, which is just this. You have superoxide, you have hydrogen peroxide, and then you have the hydroxyl 
free radical. Of these three, the hydroxyl free radical is the most dangerous of all free radicals. It is the most dangerous because it can cause the most damage to cellular function and it can really mess up cells. So this is what we really want to make sure that we are preventing uh, from happening. And our body has intrinsic pathways to prevent that. We have the scavenger uh, 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 enzymes that will actually prevent these free radicals to damage our body. Now, when it comes to free radicals, the uh, the actual free radical is going to damage the cellular function itself, and it damages cells by actually uh, peroxidation of the lipid membrane. And it can also affect protein modification as well as DNA breakage. And this is how free radicals can lead to uh, a cancer. And this is one of the reasons why we stress antioxidants, because antioxidants prevent free radical formation and damage. So that's why antioxidants are so important for our body because they can help with preventing this DNA damage or this DNA breakage happening and they can also play a role in preventing cancer. That's the basic concept of antioxidants. Now, free radicals can also induce cellular apoptosis, especially if they damage the cell very, very significantly, which they can do in an oxidative burst. Now, the good thing is these uh, decay spontaneously and you have antioxidants in your body usually uh, going through uh, uh, making sure that these free radicals aren't constantly destroying and wreaking havoc on our body. Some of those antioxidants are vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E. All right, your vitamins are very important for that reason amongst many. You also have different mechanisms for metal. Remember we said that metal like iron can actually lead to free radical formation? Well, the way our body handles metal transport is by having metal carrier proteins. So in terms of iron, we have a protein called transferrin that binds to iron in the bloodstream so that iron doesn't lead to free radical formation in the bloodstream and iron isn't constantly causing havoc. Same thing for copper. You have a metal carrier protein called ceruloplasmin, which is actually going to bind copper and it's going to prevent copper from doing the same thing. So that's one way we prevent it. Actually, that's that's the second way. The first way would be antioxidants. The second way is preventing metal carrier, uh, metal carrier proteins. And then the third way is having scavenging enzymes. This is very important because remember earlier I said that our body is able to prevent the free radical damage from occurring. The way it does that uh, along the way, it's specifically dealing with the free radicals is by the scavenging enzymes. So we have three scavenging enzymes we're gonna talk about right now. The first one is superoxide dismutase, the second one is catalase, and the third one is glutathione peroxidase. So let's go ahead and let's repop up our uh, this slide right here from earlier in the lecture where we talk about how oxygen can become water through free radical, uh, and, and actually generate free radicals along the way as they accept electrons. But we also put these enzymes right here. And this is to show you where these enzymes play a role. Superoxide dismutase will, uh, will help with preventing superoxide from damaging the body. It's a scavenger for here. Hydrogen peroxide will actually, uh, sorry, uh, hydrogen peroxide will actually be uh, uh, taken care of by catalase. Catalase will turn hydrogen peroxide, two hydrogen peroxide molecules into two H2O plus O2. Okay, so it'll convert into water and oxygen. This is pretty important because certain uh, white cells, uh, sorry, excuse me, certain bacterial cells actually has actually have catalase. They have catalase because that is their defense mechanism against our defense mechanism. Our defense mechanism is that we can pre we can prevent the infection by causing uh, a a reaction where hydrogen peroxide is essentially formed to kill off that bacteria cell. But if the bacteria cell has a catalase enzyme within it, if it is a catalase positive bacteria cell, they can convert the potentially dangerous hydrogen peroxide simply into water and oxygen and be able to thrive. That's why catalase is very important. And then finally, glutathione peroxidase plays a role in preventing this very important and very dangerous free radical. Okay, the hydroxyl radical is taken care of by the scavenging enzyme glutathione 
peroxidase. So now we've talked about different scavenging enzymes, we talked about the metals, but we're gonna now finalize this topic by discussing two main things. The first one is chemicals. Chemicals play a really important role and they can really damage our body. And one way they can damage our body is through forming free radicals. And one such chemical you need to know for the boards for your exams is carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is important because it is commonly, commonly used in the dry cleaning industry. This is a very high yield fact in case you get a vignette where a patient comes in who is a dry cleaner who is complaining of different problems, especially jaundice and getting fat and having ascites, all right? We're gonna talk about why that makes a difference in a second. But carbon tetrachloride has to do with the dry cleaning industry. So what happens is that when carbon tetrachloride enters the blood, it becomes a carbon trichloride radical. Now, this occurs due to the CYP450 enzyme in the liver. And when this process happens, you are actually going to damage hepatocytes. This free radical will then damage hepatocytes. And the first stage is going to be the reversible damage stage. Okay. If you recall from our cell injury lecture, in the reversible damage stage, you are going to get cell swelling because you are going to block the sodium potassium ATPases, which is going to cause an increase of intracellular sodium, which water will flow into the cell for, and then you will get the cell to swell up. Along with the cell, the rough endoplasmic reticulum will swell up and the ribosomes will fall off. When the ribosomes fall off from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you will decrease protein synthesis. And a decrease in protein synthesis will cause a loss of the apolipoproteins. Apolipoproteins are important for the fat. We need to get rid of the fat molecules in our liver, right? So because you are getting uh, rid of the apolipoproteins, the fat cells or the fat is actually going to enter the liver cell, but it will not be able to leave. The fat will stay in the cells because you have no apoproteins anymore. When you see that, the histologic finding is going to be fatty change in the liver along with central lobular necrosis. This is very important. This is a very high yield topic you need to remember because very few ways are you going to see this type of presentation where you have essentially fatty liver disease in someone who works in the dry cleaning industry and is healthy otherwise. So the way it works is because of carbon tetrachloride becoming carbon trichloride radical, which damages the hepatocytes and causes a decrease in protein synthesis, specifically the apolipoproteins, and that leads to fatty liver. This is what it looks like under histology. And by the way, before I move on, I wrote high yield AF, so you for, don't forget this is a very high yield slide, high yield AF. All right, this is the histology slide. And as you can see, these are the normal uh, uh, liver cells right here, hepatocytes, and these are all your fatty liver cells. You can tell they're fatty because you have all this fat inside the cytoplasm. This is all fat. These are not dead cells, and you know these are not dead cells because you have you have uh, nuclei in essentially every cell, okay? Each of these cells have nuclei, but these are actually fat molecules, fat globules in the liver cells in the hepatocytes. So that's one thing you need to know. And then the last thing when it uh, comes to free radicals is reperfusion injury. Reperfusion injury is one of the major causes of free radical injury after a thrombolytic event. So let's say you get a thrombus. The classic scenario being that a thrombus occludes the blood supply to the heart. All right. And when this happens, you can either you can either give thrombolytics or you can go and remove the thrombus at, in the cath lab. Whatever way it is, essentially, you are going to cause blood circulation to return to that uh, occluded part of the, the heart. The return of the blood to the occluded tissue is going to result in the formation of free radicals. And this is gonna cause further damage to the tissue. It sounds counterintuitive, right? You would think that when you actually start perfusing again, it would cause the tissue to heal. But in certain cases, you can, you can actually cause reperfusion injury. This is just something that can happen and there's really nothing you can do to prevent this from happening. When you see this, especially in the case of a heart where you have an occlusion, this can lead to further increase in the cardiac enzymes, specifically the troponins. And if you see that, you can consider uh, this being caused by a reperfusion injury. 
This is a very, very quick overview of reperfusion injury. We're going to cover it more in detail in the lectures to come. But for now, I hope this was helpful and educational, and I hope you learned something about free radical injury. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support really means a lot to us. It allows us to keep this content free and affordable for everyone. And if you want to see more content like this, go to our website, www.madmedicine.org, where you can see more free educational content. Thank you.